Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to uh, First Look at Humblewood on Roll20 with me, Carlos Luna. Um, this is weird. I almost never stream alone, so uh, I get to listen to myself, and I'm my favorite, so that completely works out. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, Humblewood on Roll20, specifically the Roll20 version that's on here. And uh, side note, if you're watching this now or if you're watching it in the future on YouTube, there will be a lot of spoilers. So if that's something you care about, uh, there's a bunch of videos on the right hand side that you can probably click uh, or click the roll 20 button below uh, and check out other videos on the channel. We're going to be going through uh, the adventure and we'll be going through, of course, uh, a lot of the races and items and uh, new baddies that we have inside here. So yeah, if that matters to you, definitely uh, stop watching right now. Cool, we're safe, guys. Uh, they're gone. Uh, we can start talking about Humblewood right now. Uh, yeah, so I remember hearing about Humblewood a while ago um, when it was on Kickstarter. Uh, I think uh, Serena actually backed it. And... Um, yeah, I mean, it looks adorable. The artwork looks amazing, and I'm so surprised. And when it came out, I was very surprised. Like, no one has done this before. Like, I imagine someone has, but, like, not on this level. Um, so, yeah, let's talk about Humblewood on Roll20. Uh, if you are new to Roll20 or if you're new to buying things on the marketplace at Roll20, uh, I'm going to go over that real quickly. I think that's really important. Sometimes you watch these first looks uh, and they're already in the game. They're already playing it. But you might be new on Roll20. This might be the first book you buy, right? Because you can play on Roll20 for free. So you might not have ever thought about buying a book before. Or you might think, oh, I would just buy the physical book. Why would I buy a book on Roll20? Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk about that because I think it's better. I think it's easier. Uh I think it's easier to um, actually go through the content the way Roll20 kind of like piece, pieces it out for you. Um, and it definitely makes it easier for you to um, uh, look up things on the fly instead of like flipping through it. So there's pros and cons. Um, so what you're going to do, you're going to go to Roll20. Let me get let me get smaller here. Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, I've been planning that little uh, joke for a while. Uh, you're going to go over to uh, the marketplace on Roll20. Um, so let's go to the marketplace uh, and see what's new. And what you're going to do is just, you know, we'll just search for Humblewood. Uh, Humblewood. Uh, enter a couple times. It says pre-order, but I got to clear my cash. Uh, it, it's definitely available. I double check with the production person. Uh, so yeah, Humblewood campaign setting. So again, this might look like you're getting uh, your typical book or a PDF that you might buy online. So you might be thinking, I don't need this. Like, I'd rather have a physical book or I don't need this. Like, I can just look it up or enter it myself or whatever. And you're definitely welcome to do all, that, all those things. Uh, but Roll20 does offer... Uh, a bunch of convenient stuff uh, for your game to get you like going right out the gate. So um, so what you'll do, you'll purchase this game uh, like this, and you're probably wondering, well, how do I actually use it? Well, there's a couple different ways that you could actually use the book. You can look it up in the compendium. So now that you have it, you can go to uh, tools and then compendium right here and that'll take you to this page and it'll take you to all your dungeons and dragons books and you can flip through the pages and look through the glossary and stuff like that um that's easy I, again i think one of the conveniences of having so it'll take you to this page uh you'll click on humblewood and then uh you'll get the table of contents and you'll be able to click on any section and look at it like any other um you know, online site that makes books available for you. So you'll get all these different sections. And this is kind of the traditional way of learning these modules and learning these settings, these campaign settings. 
And I should say, in, in case you didn't know about Humblewood, it is 5e compatible. Uh, so F Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, uh, it is compatible with that system. So if you're used to playing that, um, this will be an easy way just to like port over. So this is one way that you can start learning the book and reading up on it and individually going through it. Um, I like learning in game, uh, which is not the same as learning in a active game um, or learning with other players or anything like that. I mean, I like setting up a game and uh, learning the way Roll20 laid it out for me, uh, which you might not, if you've never bought a game on Roll20 or a module on Roll20, you might not think that would be better. Uh, I consider it better. And here's why. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to start a new game. And uh, how you'll do that is you'll go up at the top, you'll click games, and um, there'll be a drop down that says create new game. And you'll just select that and then select Humblewood. Um, I would do that right now, but uh, there is a secret game that I do not want to broadcast uh, on here right now because it hasn't been announced yet. So uh, I, you will not see that process. I just realized it right before I went live. Um, but you will get um, this page, um, which is kind of like your, your pre-launch page. It allows you to add players on the right-hand side, add token markers, stuff like that. Um, so my voice has been cutting out often. Is that true? Um, let me know in the chat. I just saw that right now. Um, okay. Eh, might be a connection thing. Uh, cool. Thanks. So it'll take you to this landing page and this is how I like to learn books. So you're going to learn the Carlos Luna way to learn books on roll 20. I actually like going into settings and clicking the game settings. Um, and what I do is I turn off all the other books that I have available. Uh, sometimes I like to make them available if I'm playing things and I have, you know, I'm lucky enough to have all the books, uh, <laughs> which you might not have all these books, but what I'll do is I'll turn them all off. Uh, so I'll turn off all the books and, and what's happening in, in this section, if you're wondering is roll 20 takes all the information in all these books and it filters and organizes them for you. So all you have to do, if you're looking for something, you know, in the monster manual and you want to know about that on the fly, uh, you can just search, you know, uh, it'll bring up those categories. So if you're looking for monsters, it'll bring up not only the monster ma manual, but uh, the monsters in Odysseys of Theros, you know, um, and that way you can cross reference things on the fly very easily. Um, when learning a new book, though, I like turning all of these things off uh, just so the filter is just on uh, Humblewood, right? So it's just on this section for me. And I find this way to be the best because it's really focused and everything is kind of like piecemealed out for me in a, in a way that I can devour that book. Uh, yeah, traditional books, you know, they're laid out in a way. I actually have the Humblewood book right here. So uh, traditional books, they're laid out in a way that you kind of, you know, they're linear, obviously. So you have to go, okay, well, it wants me to learn about uh, all the races first, you know, so, so I have to learn about the, do I have to learn about the races before I actually start the adventure or can I start it in between? And you think, well, I better, I better just learn it just in case. So then you learn about the races and then it goes into classes. Uh, and then it might go into lore. And then, I mean, with this book, you're on page 86, uh, before you actually hit the adventure, um, which it's cool. Like, don't get me wrong. Like all that information is great. and makes it easier for me to learn the adventure. Um, but it doesn't allow me to learn the adventure in real time. Right. Uh, because I bought, I, I want, like, it's a campaign setting. Great. All those things are excellent and I want to use them, but I can't use them until I can start, uh, the story, you know? Um, so I want to learn the story, but then I have to like, it's, it's almost like you have to like read up on, uh, um, a, read up on all the information before you take the test, right? Like if the game itself is a test, I have to read up on all that before I'm able to actually, you know, play the game. Roll20 makes it a little bit easier than that. And 
I find it easier. I'm a visual learner. I also, you know, have ADHD. I jump around a lot. I get like hooked on one thing and want to play with it first before I move on to the next thing. Um, sometimes when I'm just reading blocks and blocks of text, I just get lost and I keep rereading things. Uh, so a site like this is really good for me. Um, so yeah, so let's start, let's start it off. Um, after you change all your settings, your campaign settings and save them, you'll go back to, ooh, where is it? I guess I could just click back here. Yeah. And then you just launch your game. So it's really just as simple as that. So if you're new, your game's done here. You can invite your players or send them a link. Um, yeah, so that part is covered. Uh, when we go into the game, when we go into Humblewood, so this is roll 20 now. We're on the virtual tabletop. We can see that everything is uh, laid out for me. Um, so our production team has gone through the book has gone through the scenarios for you uh, and has set up the pages and the scenarios described uh, with the artwork provided. Uh, sometimes if artwork isn't provided, they might fill in stuff for like tokens and stuff like that. Um, so all of that is already set up for you. Great. That's already worth the price of the book uh, plus all these extras. Um, on top of that, uh, the adventure is there for you, already set up, um, and then um, split up into pieces are the categories, right? So the feats, the items, uh, the lore, the monsters, the races, uh, and within the adventure itself, all of these are hyperlinked, which is so incredibly helpful when you're starting a new adventure. Um, so remember when I talked about in the the first 86 pages of this book is just classes and, um, you know, races and all different types of lore that you have to learn and know uh, all these things that are referenced in the adventure that might you, you might be confused in real time uh, have links where you can just like pop out and you can see like, oh, well, that's what they're talking about. You know, when they mention, you know, the Scorch Grove or when they mention the hedge or whatever, the tenders, uh, you could actually see these linked in real time and read up on them and then go back to your adventure. Um, so yeah, let's take a look at this. I am not gonna go through every single thing in the book. Uh, I'm going to start skimming stuff. Uh, I have a list of everything that's provided in here. Uh, where is it? Yeah. On the marketplace, you can see that there is a list of um, things that we prep. So there's 45 creatures uh, that are available for just dragging and dropping. So that's the other thing too. These creatures are drag and drop. Um, normally, if you're at home, you might have to make your own uh, character sheet for these characters uh, where you have to stat them and like all that stuff. You don't have to do anything. Our production team does that in advance for you. Uh, so all you have to do is just select the artwork. It's tied to like all the stats and you can just start playing with them. Um, there are 10 bird folk and uh, 10 bird folk and humble folk races, uh, 12 sub races. Uh, and, oh yeah. And it's all incorporated into the character mancer. And if you're not familiar with the character mancer, it allows you to build your character quickly. Um, kind of just like a, um, I don't know, like clip, the Clippy wizard from Microsoft or something. Uh, yeah, and it's all integrated into that. There are four subclasses uh, with the Roll20 character mancer, seven unique feats. Uh, I read them and some of them are so cute. Uh, seven unique items, 10 new spells uh, that are also drag and drop. So you can just drag them to uh, your character sheet, which is awesome. Um, and yeah, it's built into the character mancer, which is fantastic. Uh, I don't know if you guys are like me, but the character mancer ruined me, right? Like if I, I <laughs> not too long ago, I tried playing a game where my buddy's like, oh yeah, I started playing Dungeons Dragons too. I'm like, cool, man. Like, that's awesome. Like we should play. And he's like, yeah, yeah. Like, let's build a character. And like, I was hanging out with him. He was like, you know, he's like had questions and we were running through like, a character build and oh my god was it hard it was so yeah spoiled rotten i am spoiled rotten with it um and i'm just you know flipping through pages trying to connect things and you know whatever um so three new backgrounds uh with the roll 20 character mancer and uh comes with an arc pad so that's really cool 
Um, yeah, so let's jump into it. Um, so when you get your game, you'll open it up. It'll be a start here, give you some credits, information. Uh, there's also this introduction into the woods um, that, uh, you know, kind of just goes through the adventure for you, running the campaign, yada, 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 uh, and an overview. Um, yeah, all these will be different in different games. Um, but I mean, literally, I, I was going to prep for this by sitting down and reading the book. And I actually like sat down and was like, okay, let's see if I can cover it. And it just wasn't I am. I would. I also realized like I was ruined by Roll Twenty, where I'm just like, that's not how I learn games anymore. I learn games by opening up the game and learning in real time. So let's go to part one, right? Um, we're gonna go to part one. We're gonna open part one. The adventure begins, and we'll click on it. Um, and uh, it it just tells you right off the bat like these are for first level characters. Uh, this is a great game to play with like people who are new to Dungeons and Dragons, and maybe like kind of don't aren't feeling the dungeon the dungeony dragony aesthetic um you know different people have different tastes obviously so uh this might be a good game for them you got some uh fluffy fluffy characters and also these characters are real size like that bird is like probably five and a half feet tall five six feet tall uh that makes it even more adorable uh which i love uh just I don't know. I just love the idea that like this guy would be knee height on me or something. Uh, but it's just, that'll be fun. Um, yeah. And the other thing too, once, once you have this book and it's incorporated, you could always turn this, these characters on and these races on in your other games too. Right. Uh, so if you want it to be a hedge or, you know, uh, a Corvin or something like that in another one of your games, it's just that easy. Um, so the thing about these, let, let's talk about, it. there's basically these, uh, two, um, types of races in there. Um, there are humble folk and bird folk. And as you get guess, bird folk, uh, are birds, right? Uh, they are flightless birds. They can kind of glide, uh, but they can't actually flap their wings, uh, and fly away. Um, humble folk live on the ground. Uh, they are grounded. They don't have wings or anything. And they kind of live in this world. Let's bring it up. Uh, let's bring up the humble woods. Yeah. Uh, so this is the world of Humblewood. Uh, and they all live here. And as uh, I guess the backstory is uh, they kind of live separately, but then they start becoming friends and they start like kind of living in each other's lives and kind of build these towns. And the, the biggest city that they build is um, in a Adler Heart. Um, there are, you know, treaties and stuff like that that are in place uh, for them to build, you know, greater cities. And there's all this peace that's happening at this time. But then like this great fire starts um, and starts scorching the grove uh, and starts getting closer to, uh, to Alder, Alder Heart. And what that causes, it starts misplacing humble folk, right? And some bird folk too, because some bird folk do live in the town, in towns, and they live on the ground um, and vice versa. But um, what we have here are people that are misplaced and like kind of in uh, refugees, right? Um, and are looking for uh, places to go and places to live. And they head to like the big capital, Elderheart, uh, seeking refuge. And as these fires keep displacing people, uh, Elder Heart is getting bigger and bigger. And the birds that are in charge there uh, start kind of blocking people from moving in, right? Turning people away. Or if they do manage to, um, you know, make it into the city, they are in slums in the trunk somewhere. Um, or they, there's no work to be done. They're unemployed. Um, which is really sad. Like I, I did not expect it to be this heavy as I started reading it. And obviously it, it doesn't read heavy in the book. Um, it, it reads very simple and plain and, um, 
you know, you kind of feel for everyone involved too. Like even the bird folk, they have to turn away. They still did take into consideration. Like they're like, well, if we help everyone, how can we help anyone? You know, like what can we possibly do? Um, but this also leads for a coalition um, to be born, a bandit coalition, uh, basically outcasts uh, that, you know, don't want to live in these slums that are tired of like, uh, you know, scraping uh, for food and, you know, any type of um, shelter. Uh, and they band together and they basically become bandits uh, and kind of they're at war with Elderheart. Um, when you get this book on Roll20, you do get pages like this. Uh, this is something that a GM sees, but your players will see something like that. Um, let me turn it off all the way. Something like that, uh, where they can't see where everything is labeled uh, in real time. So we'll turn that back up so we can see everything. So yeah, the adventure begins in this place called Meadowfen, and that is found over here. Uh, and it's basically your typical small town, uh, your, after your players build their characters, uh, they can kind of just, you know, hang out here, talk to some people, talk to some NPCs, um, and kind of get acquainted with, as they're getting acquainted with their character and each other and hanging out, um, then you can kind of start, uh, the adventure. So you can tell them they, they can learn about the backstory, about the great blaze, about um, uh, how someone went to go investigate it. Uh, they can learn about, uh, you know, different places and different, uh, like the, the Moak Fields or Elderheart. You can kind of explain all these things in the beginning of it. Uh, the adventure really begins, though, with uh, one of the bird folk, uh, Kara Stor Stormsinger, um, coming back into the town. Uh, so... They want to go explore what was going on with these fires. Uh, and when they come back, they have a message for an elder and, uh, you know, uh, all the danger that's involved uh, and whatnot. And this is what I'm talking about, about learning in real time, because I literally opened the game. I bought the game. I opened the game. I was able to click part one. Um, and in a book where I would see Kara Stormsinger. I'd be like, well, who's this character, right? And then I have to find another page. I have to look it up in the back to see the stats and like all that. But Roll20 makes it so easy. All I have to do is just click their name. Uh, I get like a little bio on them. I can click their character sheet and see what they got going on there. Um, and I kind of just leave it, for me, I just leave it open um, so I can visually see who is talking. Uh, so this person comes back and they're like, oh, well, I need, is, I, I need to talk to, um, um, Ardwin, the elder in charge of Meadowfen. Uh, and that's easy too. So I can just click that. So now I'm, I'm, I'm piecing the story together visually in real time. Um, and this is so much easier for me to learn this way, guys. And, you know, other people might be different, but this is really quick for me. Um, so yeah, they they explain like, hey, something's going on. We need help from the scorch. The fires of the Scorch Grove uh, have started to spread. We need help. Uh, we're hoping that you, you know, this traveling, you know, you, all you and your companions can go and get help uh, at Ed Edler help Heart. And that's how the adventure begins, right? You're supposed to go to the city, talk to these birds that are like in charge. Uh, basically their government and you're, you know, just like little farm folk people. Uh, and you have to find a way to get help to your small, uh, village in town. Uh, so, and you're all at level one too. Um, so yeah. And it starts off right away. It's like, Hey, uh, this person's in trouble, scorch earth. This person's like, Hey, let me send you on your way. Um, and you're off to the races and you start down this road right here. Um, and you, these are the places you'll have to pass through. And right away, the party is met, uh, with some bandits, right? Uh, three hooded figures. And then some, uh, fourth one, like off in the distance. And they're like beating up on, uh, someone that you can see, uh, your party definitely can start making choices here. And it's really cool because like, okay. Uh, and 
like I can literally play this game in real time if I if I really wanted to with zero prep. Uh, it's as easy as, you know, just clicking who these bad guys are like, OK, there's three of these guys uh, uh, make Pac Pac or Patch. I looked it up online and the woman said Patch, but then someone said Pac. So Ma Pac, May Pac, how do you guys say that? Ma. That's still how it's spelled. Pac, Patch, P-A-T-C-H. How does it sound? Ma Pac. Pock. Pock. Okay. Like faux hawk. Ma pock. I'm going with that. Cool. Uh, <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> raccoon. Yeah, raccoon guy. Look at how adorable they are. This is a bandit. This is an adorable bandit. And like, it's also one of those things that like, oh, he's, this, this is an adorable bandit. But also like, this bandit is like, your height uh it's like getting beat up by a chuck e cheese character right uh give me all your money right now it's like oh god okay uh chill out <laughs> uh so there are three bandits uh uh mapak bandits that are out to get you uh and again i can click them and i'm ready to go right um i can see what they have going on short sword short bow resilience uh, you know, their stats are all laid out. And then there's this, uh, person, uh, Frey Meridian, uh, and, and it's, uh, one of the captains of the bandit forces, right. Um, of this coalition, uh, bandit coalition. And, you know, explains that if your players do this, this happens, um, the bandits are going to try to run, a, uh, are going to fight you. Um, you can try to get them. You could also try to pass without bothering them too. Uh, the bandits are going to shake you down for a bribe for, uh, money. Uh, and if you pay them anything less than like five gold pieces, um, they're going to kick your butt. Um, they are beaten up on a poor little lady. Um, trying to shake her down for her goods and wares. So yeah, I mean, I can't even imagine playing with friends that are like, ah, let her fend for herself. So you'll probably beat them up. Um, if Frey is going to probably hang back a little bit. And if, you know, you clobber these guys real quick, Frey's going to run away. Uh, if you go after Frey, uh, there's all this stuff that's going to happen in the forest. They basically don't want you to go after Frey. They don't want you um, to to get Frey. But if you do, not a problem. You gain their sword. Um, but yeah, there's right off the bat, use the forest encounter um, rollable table, uh, which is great. You could just have, you know, as they enter the forest, you could have your players roll for what happens and what they encounter. Uh, they can get a swarm of ember bats. And again, like, Back to roll 20. In a book, it would say, look at these forest encounters. And then you would look at it and you'd be like, uh, okay, I found the page for forest encounters. What do I do? And then it's like, oh, uh, swarm of ember bats. Well, you just opened up this book five seconds ago and you're trying to play it. What the hell are ember bats? It's like, well, here I can just click it, you know? And again, in real time, I can play this game, uh, which is amazing. The character sheet's right there. We can start playing. Uh, I'm actually curious if anyone's done that before. Uh, I'm not brave enough to do that. I like, I, I have, um, Ember bats are not so cute. Uh, <laughs> they are, they are not, uh, they look absolutely terrifying and disgusting. N no one's nose should be directly in between their eyeballs and, you know, on fire. Um, but yeah, like I'm, I'm not brave enough to play in real time. I have anxiety and I would need to research all this, but it is completely doable, right? Like you are seeing me do this in real time. And if your players are role players, it saves you enough time to just, you know, scan it and read it real quick uh, before you move on to the next thing. Um, so yeah, you basically save this uh, woman and her cart and her wares. And um, she asks you to help her uh, uh she's going to the same place so she's going to elder heart just like you and she asks if you would escort her um she doesn't feel safe stuff like that and yeah you probably will i mean you're going the same direction it'd be really awkward just you say no and then you walk side by side all the way there um 
but she does need to take a break. Uh, and, and the reason is like, she needs to take a break at this uh, reach, this um, win winnowing uh, reach place. He'll go there and get on some ember bats, yada, 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 uh, you know. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I did not mention the fact that she's a kitty. This is very important. God, I can't believe I glossed over it. I'm not a big fan of cats. I will let you know that. But this cat has two different color eyes. And I think that negates anything I have to say bad about cats. Uh... <laughs> So yeah, um, she is uh, one of these cat-like people, uh, native to Humblewood. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, she's a very savvy, savvy merchant. She, it's so weird because she is uh, towing her cart, which actually slows her down. So maybe one of your characters might want to uh, take the cart and um, help her out as well. That'll speed up the adventure. But, uh, yeah, she, she's very savvy because, you know, she's on the road selling her goods. And I, and I think for like the first part of this book, you're just like, oh, I feel so bad for this person. But then you get to like Elderheart and she has like her own booming business. And I'm like, why, why didn't you tell me you had this? And then she offers you a bunch of other stuff. Uh, but yeah, your, your players don't know that yet. Um, oh, look, <laughs> four hit points save her uh yeah so you you wind up hitting some bats great uh you go into uh the winnowing reach and it leads to this map here uh we're gonna open that up and that's on the map usually when you see here's the other thing too usually when you see artwork um so if you look on the right hand side, when you see you know part one, Winnowing Reach, uh, the Moken Den, when you see artwork there, um, it usually means that there might be a map attached to that page. So it's always a good thing to just you know click your page toolbar right here, this blue button, and check to see if it's there. So Winnowing Reach is there. I'm gonna click on it. Uh, again, all these bubbles your players will not see. Uh, you will, though. And it's kind of like laying out all uh, of winnowing reach for your players to check out. Um, so winnowing reach. Uh, we're not going to go through all these. I didn't know that this is the old way of saying jail. Uh, G-A-O-L. Is it still pronounced the same? Um I think it is. So I'm going to minimize this for you. If you just double click, you can minimize and you can see this artwork. I mean, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's also very thoughtful. Like when I look at it, I see, you know, obviously it looks pretty and stuff, but it's so thoughtful in, in how they look at like how a bird would use this or how, you know, um, a cat or a hedgehog might use this um, and just shows the evolution of it, which I really do enjoy. Anyways, uh, back to, yeah, it's pronounced the same jail. That's so weird that this, this breaks my head. Uh, I'm, you know, reading isn't my forte, but that just breaks my head for some reason. Uh, so yeah, different places, not a lot that your players can get here, but they probably didn't start with a lot, so they probably can't buy a lot of things. Um, Eliza does offer to offer certain wares, and there's not like a list of everything that she has on her. Uh, it's pretty much up to you. The book suggests that your players roll a D6, and uh, depending on if they roll an even or an odd, she might have an item similar to what they're asking for. Um, there is, uh, an apothecary, uh, they have some herbs and, um, they may have some potions of healing. The other thing that it makes you, uh, look into is, uh, the magistrate's office and the jail. Um, so it, while it is tiny, um, it isn't like, um, uh, you can turn in the bandits that you may have taken in 
Not sure. I never think about that in real time. And they were like, oh, better take them to the jail. But I guess a normal person who saw Bandit would probably take them to jail. Uh, I I don't think in real time like that. But maybe you have real nice players and they they think about the law. Uh, so, yeah, they they go and. um. Uh, after your players walk around for a while, the magistrate will find your players. So that's what you'll go into next. And he kind of explains, uh, or she explains, uh, Walden Crane. Uh, that's what their face looks like. It looks like text. Um, <laughs> uh, is a corvum, and uh, corvums are um, crows. They're crow people, crow folk. They. This one in particular is kind of like, hey, we got this missing researcher and we'll go over the character mancer and these different types of characters. Um, but I just want to show you guys how to play quickly. So uh, this magistrate is like, yo, we got this researcher. She was studying the slime. Uh, if you can find this researcher, that would be great. Uh, I'll write you a letter. Right. That'll I'll that'll kind of get you a fast pass uh, when you get to. Alderheart. Basically, you're going to Alderheart, which is the capital, and you're wanting to talk to uh, these high-ranking politicians, so it'd be really good to have a letter uh, in hand to give to them. And that's what, basically, this magistrate offers you um, uh, in service of your good deed of saving this person. So, um, if your party agrees, which they probably will, you're going to go to um, uh, the Moken Den Caverns, uh, which is here. It's like the swampy land. Again, remember, we see the image right in front of it. So there's probably a page to go with it. And they'll take it here. Um, one thing while reading this is... A lot of where, uh, a lot of where these, how this map in particular works is kind of up to you. So you might be thrown by like, okay, well, if they enter here, why, how do they get around or how do they get? So like a lot of these areas that are marked and it'll, it'll tell you in the adventure what those X's mean, but basically like, depending on how long you want this to go, uh, you know, this researcher, uh, uh, Kina, um, Kenna is kind of like hidden on this GM layer. So your players can't see. So they kind of look like this. Um, let's see. Uh, I guess not. Okay. I guess not. I might've moved her, but probably hidden on a GM layer. That way, uh, you can move them around depending on how long you want them playing in this area, right? Because there's a bunch of things that can affect them and a bunch of things that they can learn about the world uh, based on these encounters. So there's also, again, they enter this dangerous swamp. There's an encounter list that you can figure out uh, where, you know, bird folk skeleton. Again, I can just click it and I see the skeletons and I'm there and, you know, maybe they're role playing right now and I'm just rolling. And I'm like, okay, sticky slimes, cool. This is good. I could just drop this in there. Um, yeah, so if you notice the map, it kind of doesn't connect in a very fluid way. We are like, okay, they're going to go from, they're going to start at A and they're going to end up in B. Um, when we look at the map, it kind of just all roads kind of lead to the middle, uh, which you may not want. So just be aware of that that you can like toss these guys around in different places. Um, it really, it's really up to you. Um, so you basically find this person. So it has like a collapsing hazard, falling slime, blah, blah, more slime attack. Uh, you, you finally find this researcher and save them. Uh, and then they're like, Hey, help me get some more slime. Like, what were you doing in there? Uh, so they were captured by the slime and the slime can capture people. Um, yeah. So she wants to find slime. It's, you know, imperative to her research. Uh, she will give you, um, what does she give you? Party must. Yeah. 
Yeah. Slime samples? She has vials. She pass out. Yeah. Anyways, you bring her back, and then uh, you return back to the Reach, other places that um, this magistrate's like, yo, thank you so much. You found this person. Oh, we appreciate you. Hold on. I'm a little bit busy. I can't write you your letter right now. Uh, but seriously, stay here. Uh, everything's chill. Just hang out tonight. And like at that point, your players are going to be like, wait, what? You just how long does it take to write a letter? Like, and he's like, oh, I'm very, you know, very, very important. Uh, can't be bothered with this right now. And you're mm, OK, whatever. Um, so you'll hang out. <laughs> and the next day, of course, you know, uh, he's going to ask for more, uh, <laughs> and he's going to make a second request. So many people are going to bother you in this world. Everyone's just feeling really, really brave about how much they ask for, how much they ask from strangers in this world. Uh, so once you go back to, uh, the winnowing reach, the magistrate's going to ask for, uh, more help. Basically, that there is a witch uh, that lives in the swamp, and they want uh, they want a charm that's around their neck. They believe it's a source of power, uh, and it's gonna you know at, you're gonna go to this hut and kill this witch, which is like basically you went from like a search party to like assassins very quickly in this magistrate's mind like oh you're very good at finding people you obviously must be good at murder as well uh which kind of offends me a little bit but whatever uh especially when this this witch is called susan of the swamp <sighs> walden crane is a turd bird you guys are correct on that one uh but yeah susan of the swamp so you, you go to susan's hut uh, you go to the swamp, which, uh, you go to her hut and, you know, you're, you could attack right away. Your players might want to attack her right away. Um, if they try talking, uh, she is definitely super reasonable and very nice and she's a hedge. Uh, also, yeah, she's a hedge. I should show you that. Uh, Susan of the swamp. Look at her. Look at how cute she is. She's just a little hedge girl. Uh, yeah, let me actually bring this up here. Little hedge. Yeah, uh, a little eccentric for a witch or a hedgehog. I don't even know. Are hedgehogs eccentric? Who knows? But yeah. She tells you like her charm, their charm or her source of her power or whatever that that guy thinks is literally just an ocarina and she like plays a little flute for you uh and she's like yeah um i'm trying to figure out this stuff too and what she's working on she's actually working on there's so many people working on solving these things which like makes it impossible to hurt or hate them like the first person in the beginning is like researching the scorch grove this other woman's researching it's like just women in science in this world trying to save the world uh like like susan is trying to uh figure out what's causing the blaze uh near the scorch grove uh and she's basically trying to um cast a spell uh to talk to like a demon about it basically um and she's going to be missing need some ingredients and obviously because you're such a good search party and obviously you're such good assassins as well uh you must be good at um i don't know farming so finding you know finding this root uh or and lizard and whatnot it's going to take you into the swamp uh they'll find it there's uh you'll run into a toad or whatever a giant toad that guy's here and uh yeah it's just like a fun little thing for your players to do a little side thing they might have fun with uh and just allow them to talk about what's going on and might be able to learn more about the world at this point too so it's a little downtime area um and just like an easy task that they can do uh she does summon the demon but it won't talk uh and it'll actually attack who's ever closest uh to it so here is the demon um 
we're gonna move you to the token layer. Uh, yeah, here's this little demon guy. Man, even the demons are cute, right? That shouldn't be allowed. Like, just give me a a. Eh, maybe he's not that cute. I mean, he's. What are these? Are these like whiskers, or are they like? Is that bad breath? Still cute. Okay, everyone agrees that they're still cute. Moving on then. Uh, <laughs> so, who's ever, depending on where your um, characters are in room, it will attack the closest uh, person to them. Um, so, they just got to take out that demon. Uh, it will not answer any questions or do anything like that. Susan does offer... Uh, because the magistrate asked for you to kill them, they asked for you to bring back proof that Susan's dead. Uh, and if you let Susan live, when you go back, you have to lie. Uh, you can bring back that ocarina. If she doesn't give it to you, then, you know, you might have to lie more. That might be harder. Anyways, you go back. Uh, Susan is grateful to help you. A uh, bit ambitious. Um, yeah, and because you helped Susan, anytime you come back, she'll have like potions of healing for you, uh, potion of animal, uh, friendship, feather fall, stuff like that. So really good not to kill Susan because she's got the hook up. <laughs> uh, yeah, after dealing with, oh yeah, and this is the part that like made me upset. I'm like reading this the other night. I'm like, what the hell? So you go back, right? You go back to the reach, the winnowing reach, that dude who didn't write you, uh, the dude who didn't write you um, your your freaking letter after you helped him out, right? He's like, did you kill the witch? And you're like, uh, maybe, uh, depending on how you play it. Basically, if you can't convince him that you killed the witch, uh, he doesn't write the letter for you. What? He doesn't write the letter that, that you were supposed to get from finding that woman. I don't know why it makes me so upset. That make, that make like So this guy basically double crosses you um, and he refuses to give you the letter uh, for you to go there. So I would just burn this. Just tell tell all your players they're allowed to burn this entire, this guy's office down to the ground and uh, drag him to Susan. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. Um, after that, uh, you guys, you know, hand out some XP, blah, blah, blah. And part one's done. So it's very simple and it's very easy just to jump into the campaign, uh, get your players familiar with the world and what's going on in the world. It, it doesn't, the first part, it's five parts. And the first part doesn't get you into the city. Um, so we will talk about that because I actually think that's the funnest part so far. Uh, you know, so you start heading to the city. Let's go back to the humble woods. So you're at the winnowing reach right here, and you're going to start heading into the forest. And remember that uh, bandit coalition. Also, look at this beautiful artwork. Look at how adorable they are. It's just got that Disney Robin Hood feel to it that you just love. And, uh, yeah, these characters are great. I I, I want to talk about this story a little bit more, but uh, man, when we get to the characters, you, you guys are going to love it. The races. Um, so you're going to hear about this bandit menace and uh, this first part. So these parts where it kind of says part two, part one, it, it's kind of an overview of what you're going to be seen in this chapter, right? It kind of just goes over what you're going to be going, what they're going to be running into at this time. Um, so uh, it kind of tells about the leader of this coalition, who is uh, Bena uh, Sir Sirden. Uh, basically, a deer woman, fawn, what? I don't know. It's a deer person. Uh, but they're super strong and kind of like lead this entire thing. They, you know, tragic backstory, all that built into this character right here. Um, 
so we're going to learn a little bit more about them as we travel and we start running into bad things. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. So you probably have your letter. Uh, yeah, it is kind of like, yeah, thank you, Redwall. God, I forgot about that series. Yes, it's like playing through the Redwall book series. That's why I was so amazed that like something like this kind of hasn't hit D&D &D, uh, before. I'm sure there's other things and I'm probably not giving credit to like other I feel so bad. Other creators that have done stuff like this, but this is the first time I've seen it in a very easy and simple way, um, and and still remaining remaining cute. I think the aesthetic really gets me. Um, so yeah, you're gonna go into the forest. There's some road encounters, some ember bats, some giant elk uh, that appear um, in there. The other thing about these tokens that are in here, there's an actual tokens page on Roll20. So you can click on it. Uh, when you buy a book, there's usually a token page that has everything you need. Uh, so named NPCs and creatures, uh, all these baddies, NPCs, and more creatures. You can just go here and everything's static for you. So if you needed a bat, you can just copy and paste this into your game like that. Bam. Uh, double click it. Uh, actually, no. Shift click. Shift double click. You can see the character sheet and the bio. Bam. Super easy. So when I see things in here that I might want, um, I just go to this page and copy and paste it. Um, yeah, let's go back to uh, not there. The humble woods. Um, yeah, you meet your first. They can meet their first druid. Uh, look at this uh, rockadoodle dude. Uh, what is this guy? Hand out, meet on the road. So yeah, you can show your players this. So show it to everyone. Uh, and then it'll show up in their little area for them. I can't show it here because I have it, but yeah. So after those encounters, Rockadoodle was the best TK. Rockadoodle. Uh, also, I remember Rockadoodle having a lot of privilege, too. We'll talk about that later. That's an indoor recess conversation. Uh, so the Great Tree City, you are finally there, right? Uh, it was really scary. God, you guys are going to take me off track. Um, we're going to go to Elder Heart next. Again, uh, corresponding picture with that. With that, this is uh, kind of a breakdown of the city. So we'll look at this beautiful artwork here. And again, uh, this is all on the GM layer. So your players will actually just see that. We'll just see as they approach the city, you can just show them this. And as they go into the different areas, you can show them uh, stuff that's hidden on the GM layer. So I'll turn that on. So as you might expect, the hierarchy of classism is represented in this tree. Uh, as you move up the tree, things get better and better and better. Um, <laughs> so remember, uh, a lot of the humble folk are misplaced and they're living in different areas. They've uh, come to the tree for protection. Um, there is a perch guard uh, that comes from this area. So bird folk have a perch guard. Um, and because humble folk are scattered everywhere, they don't live condensed in a in a in a city. Uh, they kind of just ha they kind of just have their own tiny little m militias, depending on their towns. Uh, but Elderwood, because it's a metropolis, um, they could actually have a trained army, which is pretty cool. So uh, they'll start at the bottom, which you know we can just scroll down to the bottom. Um, you know, see the slums of Underfall, the Bright Hollow, which is also um, for commoners and stuff right here. Um, Trunk Market, which is kind of like a bazaar type area. Um, then it goes to the branches, which is kind of like middle class, uh, modest homes. Uh, the bows which is kind of like hoity-toity McMansion uh, type stuff. Um, 
And it, it's really interesting because they don't make it cut and dry. That's the other thing too, I should say. Uh, the book doesn't make it so cut and dry as in like birds versus, you know, uh, animals that live on the ground, you know, uh, because remember in the beginning, they were all friends and they were all, um, kind of like living in different areas. There are birds that don't, that are afraid of heights. Like there's literally, uh, God, what is it called? I'll, I'll find it later, but there's like literally a subclass, I believe of birds that are just afraid of heights and they are considered odd because they won't go into trees grounded background thank you uh yeah it's just like that all makes sense right like these things would happen and they would exist in this world uh which i love because it kind of gives it you know um makes it real and whatnot so there would be so if as a gm when you're setting this up you do feel free to say like, oh, this might be, you know, this council might be all bird folk, but there might be, you know, one hedge there. Uh, and it would make sense uh, for them to gain power in some way. And you can write an entire background and all that stuff. So, yeah, and the very top uh, council plaza, that's where your characters will need to go. So when they arrive here I mean just allow them to walk around kind of like look at the different places kind of describe it to them and so they understand the different classes and the different types of people and also the different um uh uh conditions that people live in and their mindset right uh you have people that are living in the slums that might have come from towns very similar to what your uh your players came from but now they're there and they've kind of lost hope. Um, you'll see Eliza's Emporium, which they give you a map of. Not much happens here. I guess you could use this kind of as your home base. Your players can kind of use this as their home base. It doesn't give you a lot to, to tell about it. Um, other than, you know, she hooks you up and she has stuff for sale. A uh, bunch of tables in there. Oh, yeah. And I should say that these tables, while they're still here, um, you they are available. Rollable tables are available on Roll20. So, like, you don't even have to, like, click these. You can just roll the tables in the macro section. So, if you go in the top right-hand corner, there's uh, kind of looks like, I don't know, three eyes on the side. I don't know. Uh, not eyeballs. Uh, letters. Anyways, I'll be quiet. But... Those tables are all here, so you can just roll them for yourself. Uh, Eliza's items for sale. Let's just roll that and see what we get. Uh, a small clockwork squirrel oh, made of bronze. It will hop for one minute after it has been properly uh, wound. That's great. I would love... So that that's something that I never think of uh, if I'm making a game. I never think of those like little things that might seem like a little like, what am I going to do with this? But like, you can totally see your players using that as a distraction, right? Uh, they put it in someone's tent uh, to have them look at it or maybe some kids or uh, maybe there's guards. And then all of a sudden, I just love the scene of like a little squirrel hopping in and getting the attention just so you can just like punch him right in the face. Um, oh, there's a command that gives you the marketplace link. It just came out on Roll20 today. Really? I didn't know about that. Huh. Uh, yeah. So that's Eliza's Emporium. This is all downtime and explore time for you, for your players. Uh, they can get to know this neighborhood and the neighborhoods and kind of what everything's about. The Great Tree City, Bird Folk Council. <laughs> uh, yeah, depending on whether or not they have that letter from that magistrate will get them fast tracked uh, in. Uh, if they don't, they get asked to. Oh, yeah, this is so cute. They get asked to find these bandits, uh, these thieves, uh, these uh, gerbing thieves, gerbin, gerbin, bean, bin. I don't know. Uh, they are adorable. You're supposed to catch these guys. There are four of them. Ugh. 
Look at those ears. I will take you home. You will live in my pocket. But no, this is a real person. I can just get lost thinking about having animal friends that are my height. <laughs> Did this awaken something in me? Okay. Anyways, they uh, there's these bandits. They're stealing stuff. They're wrecking stuff. Guys, they are four siblings that are orphans. Oh, uh, little, please, sir. Please. Why <laughs> is he so weird? No, you die now. Uh, yeah, so that guy exists. He's really cool. Basically, and I... Okay, so I like this book for a couple of reasons. And how they handle things like this. So they put you in a situation where you have to, you know, you think you're doing good. And like, really, there's another side of the coin, which I love. Uh, it's better than just smash, smash, kill, kill. Um, and in this one, the it really does outweigh because you find out these guys, these little kids are just like orphans. Their parents are dead. And the book goes out of your way to explain, like, you can try to convince them to stop stealing, but what will they do? How will they possibly survive? Uh, chances are, if you if they stop stealing in Alderheart, they're going to join the bandit coalition, right? Because what choice do they have? Um, you can give them money. So your players might think, oh, I know what, I'll give them some gold. That'll make me feel better about this situation. But the book literally says you can give them gold, but it will only last for this long. And then what are they supposed to do? Uh, which is good. Like, it, you know, it might be a lot, but it's good to think about like the effects the economy has on people um, at, at different classes and um, with access to different things. So now that you, now that you're into that, you uh, you head back. So that that's what happens if you um, don't have a letter. If you do have a letter, they basically like fast track you right in. And um, Pita, uh, the council speaker, white plumage. Um, she is. I think she's a Luma. Maybe. She sure. Uh, no, Gall Bright Gallus. So yeah, you meet with the speaker and uh, they're aware of the spreading fire. So you basically went there. They're like, yeah, we know. Uh, but our concern are these bandits keeping our citizens safe. Um, this is what we care about right now. We can't send more supplies out because the bandits will take them from us. Like, what do you expect us to do? Um, and yeah, you can guess they're going to get roped into bandit stuff. Um, and while you're having this conversations, bandits attack. Uh, they attack the bird folk council. Um, because the bandits are below and you're above. Don't let your players get into like a melee thing. If they fall down, they will be overcome with too many bandits. Uh, so it's better just to like kind of like help the guard, uh, like fend them off with ranged weapons. The bandits will retreat. And then, you, you know, the captain will be the captain will try to convince you to help them uh, take the fight to them. Uh, and then you'll head over to the bandit camp and try to sneak in. Bandit camp is a cool little encounter in how they uh, kind of sussed it out. There's a bunch of different options based on what, um, you know, different stages based on how your players plan on attacking, right? Uh, sneaky or arrows or rushing in. Different things are, uh, are hidden and revealed. Um, that Vulpin captain is back. Uh, so you can go after again if you take their sword the book makes it a point to save if you take their sword uh, you can kind of you know 
besides being worth something, uh, it's more of a prestige thing and it'll kind of get your respect around other bandits. So that's cool. Um, yeah. And then there's things, you know, after tearing these guys apart, there is uh, a couple things that uh, kind of shakes loose during this fight. And that is uh, one of my favorite. Where is that at? Uh, this, uh, Strig Knight, this guy, this guy's really cool. Uh, I like him. He's a cool guy. He's a knight. He's really not supposed to be any, uh, <laughs> he's really not supposed to be anything that's like, uh, like a major player or talking to your players or anything like that. Uh, as a GM, you're just supposed to introduce like his skills and his fighting style and kind of just like a little spotlight, depending on how smart your players are or, you know, uh, how much they're actually going to go after him. Uh, this is, uh, this might depend on like how big you want to make him in their eyes. You know, if your players are really paranoid or every little detail they need to like look at, maybe just explain that there's some knights fighting. It's like, ooh, this one knight's just like a little impressive or whatever. Don't make it like a big deal. Uh, but he's supposed to be like a big deal. Just not a big deal right now. This is basically you're planting the seed of like this guy exists, right? Uh, just like they planted the seeds of the other things. They planted the seeds of uh, the Scorch Grove and the research going on there. They planted the seeds of, uh, you know, the, the slime cavern going on. Uh, where is all this stuff happening? Where is it coming from? Uh, yeah, Riffin is a strig. Um, really, really cute uh, owl boy. Um, and I love him and I will fight for him every single day of my life. This I pledge to you, Riffin. Oh, Riffin, I play, <laughs> no, they, so yeah, that's really cool. I really like that. And then we just start seeing different parts of, uh, bird folk. They can start seeing the different types of the, uh, bird folk in the militia, the guard, uh, the skirmishers, um, you know, even the farmers, right? Uh, we see them on the battlefield as well. So we start seeing some damage in here, some blood and guts. Frey Meridians in here, as well as like a wolf guy. They get some cool stuff though. Uh, if you get Frey, you get uh, this brooch. Um, you have a resistance to fire damage uh, and immunity to magic missile. Cool. It's awesome. Players are probably like level one or two by now. Uh, if you, the thief has boots of speed, so that's cool. Uh, and the rest scatter. Uh, you can loot. There's stuff and treasure and gold and all these things. Uh, you're victorious. And what this really does is kind of set you up. Um, uh, I have an accent? No, I don't. Do I have an accent? I don't think I do. I talk super normal, like the guy from the dictionary.com website. Um, yeah, I, it, what it's, what's really happening is you your players have basically aligned themselves with um alderheart and the bird folk there and you they are now kind of like only up and up there right they're considered heroes and protectors of the city and stuff um when I, the book does such a good job at balancing out the two things right because on the one hand you want to care about these poor people and these refugees and these bandits and stuff like that. They do such a good job at explaining that. But on the other hand, it's just like your people are kind of benefiting from this. You're, you know, you are uh, rising up on this food chain. Just like, do you rock the boat? Do they feel like that? And based on like these different classes that they might be picking in these different religions. Oh, the religions are so cool in this book. And we're going to get to this really quickly. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm only going to do part two and yeah we're almost done with part two and then we'll go on to the next stuff um and i won't go into the other stuff but yeah the religions kind of play a part and like they've kind of they've gone through and they've really thought of a lot of cool stuff and applied it to birds and you know uh, animals and stuff like that so yeah you guys kind of are moving up in the in the ranks people want to shake your your claw and uh they want to know you uh 
you are go to people in this world now, or you're getting there. Um, you head back to uh, the tree, head back to Elderheart. And the council's like, yo, you guys were awesome. Uh, how about you take out this stronghold? <laughs> uh, so yeah, you're going to travel. Your players are going to start traveling to uh, this bandit stronghold because they're like, you know, enough is enough. Uh, you guys are going to interrogate some of these bandits that they have, or you're going to learn this information um, at Alderheart. And you're going to learn about this bandit fortress that's in the Crest Mountains. And that will, uh, you know, you can take on this job to go there and you can, you can play it any way you want. Your players might play it where like, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, we're going to go there and warn them because right now your players might be affected based on their classes on what they might want to do, um, especially being put in a position of power like that. They, before your players lead to from Elderheart to the Bandit Fortress, though, um, the book does allow you to um, do, 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 do. Uh, one interrogate to get that information. Uh, two, you could seek out that Ash Knight Riffin before you head over there, kind of like figure out what his deal. And then he lays some like knowledge on you that he's looking for his best friend, Oddwald, um, this uh, Colvin dude that like got in too deep and has disappeared and he's his best friend. He's going to track him down and your players might be like, yeah, maybe this is the adventure we want to do. And then Riffin's going to be like, nah, I'm going to do it by myself. And they're going to be like, no, really, we're going to help you. And he's like, eh, nah, I'm I don't need any help. And then if they try to find him again, he's gone. Uh, he went to go look at that. So that's another, like the book does really good. Like, um, like for every question it answers, it asks two more questions, right? It, it's going to drop um, some more information for you. So another moving part happens with Oddwalp and what he was working on uh, as well. Um, do, 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 do. Council summons you again. Once you take out the big guy now. So you kind of took out the number two. You took out Frey and they want to send you to the crest, to the bandit fortress to take out uh, Benna. The next uh, chapter is kind of like all about um, infiltrating, right? Infiltrating the uh, stronghold. You meet these tender, like uh, you learn about these tenders, which are kind of like these like healers and wood people that are like uh, trying to heal the scorch uh, earth, the grove um, trouble that might happen there. Do, do, do. Um, do, do, do. The bandit strong. Oh yeah. There's a whole big, Oh, in part two, there's a whole big thing about stronghold. Sorry. I thought that was part, part three, but no, there's still a lot more in part two. Uh, so yeah, this book is really big and dense and a lot to go through. You, you know, go through the barracks and the courtyard, uh, you know, inner keep and kind of take out uh, uh, Benna. And here is the inner keep. Different things that you can get here. Pick up different treasures as well. Uh, you do not want to let your players kind of uh, when they're in the court, they, they do not want to start a fight in the courtyard. They want to be as sneaky as possible. If they've killed Frey, uh, they might have Frey's sword so they can, because the coalition is getting bigger and bigger with new people, no one's going to know who they are. So, uh, you know, if they take some of the clothes, they're smart enough to take some of the clothes. Uh, does it come with audio tracks? That's a good question. No, it does not. Uh, it, it does not come with audio tracks. Um, but yeah, if they, um, oh, where was I? I forgot what I was. Oh yeah, if they take some of the bandits' clothes, it's easier to sneak in. Uh, if they take Frey's sword, uh, it's easier to like. It's really easy to sneak in and demand stuff from people. Um, but yeah, if they try to like bust in, it's pretty hard. They basically have an entire army at uh, like trying to kill them. Um, they could also sneak in by like pretending that they have. Uh, you know, prisoners, right? Because they're on the way to the inner keep and the prison is on the way to that. So that's an easy way to get in there too. Um, ben is going to tell you like 
you know, the bandit leader is going to kind of like tell you a story about what woes they've encountered and, you know, how they kind of seek anger, but they're also in a position where they went on this revenge spree and now they're working with people and they're seeing how much they can help people. Right. And it's up to your players on what they do. They can, um, kill or capture if they either way they will be offered either way once they defeat Benna they will be offered basically um you know the the stronghold they they could be put in a position to run it so that's a possibility as well when they head back um but yeah I mean those that's pretty detailed that I ran through part one and two with you and we're talking like how many hours would it take your players to run through all that? Um, and I did it very simply. I literally just opened it up and started reading all these things uh, in real time. And yeah, that's what I love about Roll20 and how simple it is. So, you know, uh, it goes on a little bit further. You get more into like the scorched uh, grove and what's living there and what might be causing it. Uh, you learn more about... Uh, these different type of like fire monsters and creatures and stuff. You also start learning about uh, this other city, uh, uh, Avium, uh, the mysteries of Avium. Uh, that city is located very close to Alderheart as well. If we see, it's kind of like in between the great mountains. We also start learning about what um, Oddwald was doing that, uh, that best friend of Riffin, remember? Uh, start learning about him. Uh, yeah, and this we start learning a little bit more lore and whatnot. I'm not gonna ruin every everything and go through it all because, like, you know, going through a book is its own separate um thing that just feels good when you do. But hopefully, you're hooked enough. Uh, and you see how easy it is to play with your players. Let's look at the characters. Let's look at these different races that we have here. Um, that's what I'm interested in. Um, let's see what we got here. Woo -woo. So uh, we can just save this. It'll make a fake character and we can just open up the character mancer. Yeah. So uh, choose a race. So we'll go this. We have looked at uh, Corvins, which are the... Um, uh, crow-like race. Uh, they're very, uh, very smart. They're considered some of the, one of the smartest races, I want to say. We also have, uh, which, you know, like Hedge, uh, Jerbin, uh, these Lumas. Oh, Raptor. Do, do, do. Let's set this load. Yeah, these are kind of like the, the Rangers. Uh, so adorable, right? Look how he's just standing there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sharp talons, agile, uh, swift, perceptive awareness. So I think it's really cool. The races, when the races start mixing with the religions, that's when it starts getting really cool. Um, so this is a Strig, uh, which is like these big bodied um, bird folk races. I like how it says like, I say strigs are the most uh, imposing of the bird folk races, resembling owls. Dude, that is an owl. What do you mean resembling owls? If I went into a bar and some guy was like, "You look just like an owl." If I look, if I look like this, and I went in a bar and some guy says, "You're an owl," I wouldn't say, "No, no, sir. I just resemble an owl." Uh, so you also have these uh, Vulpins, mm -hmm. a little fox people. They're super smart and tricky. Uh, I really like, you know, I, I love these things. And I'm a sucker for these things in the beginning, like these little quotes, like, My dearest, though your dangerous and reckless lifestyle worries me so, I know that you will outwit any opponent who comes your way. Great. Love it. Uh, Fox-like people. So we can pick any of these and kind of go through them. Uh, 
Gallus, I think, are the rooster people. Uh, where is it? Oh, oh, there it goes. Yeah. Kind of like these roostery guys. And more rockadoodle. Uh, roosters are, of course, singers, obviously. Uh, they're very social and communal people. Uh, bird folk. Um, very happy. Yeah, and I love that, like, with this now, you can kind of uh, incorporate it into any type of uh, Roll20 game. Uh, these servants, little deer folk, uh, these are kind of like these peaceful cleric type people. Let's see. Um, yeah, there's also... So, yeah, these little sub races, right? So you have Grove... Um, which is, what was that? What was the Grove about? Uh, very dexterous. And then you have uh, the Pronghorn, which I believe is like very strong. And yeah, antlers and robust build. So with a lot of these races, they have like sub races um, where that you can choose from. So we'll just choose like lawful on the servant, um, do to do athletic, uh, prong horn, horn. I go next, and we'll look at some classes. Uh, do to do, do, do actually sub races, subclasses. Yeah, we'll make this um, barbarian. In nature? Ah, survival. Yes. Yeah, strong, strong little foxy fox. Let's see. Uh, and nature again. And armor defense. Okay, we're not going to run through all this. Uh, I think it might be easier for me to pull up this in the compendium, actually. So if we ever wanted to like look up stuff in real time, we could obviously go through the compendium uh, like we looked it up earlier where we click on stuff and, you know, open that up and whatnot. We could also do that in game through the compendium. So there are new feats in this. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. Uh, oh, no, seven. This is an SRD feat. So aerial expert. Or a bandit cunning. Or a heavy glider. Uh, yeah, and remember aerial expert um, and heavy glider. I mentioned that these bird folk don't fly. Um, that their wing, they're too big and, you know, whatnot. So definitely some, some way to in increase that. Uh, you know, are found in these feeds. I just like the idea of just, uh, sorry, I, I kind of got lost in my own thought of just like including these on like other characters that I have in other D&D games uh, would be pretty funny. Um, yeah, bandit coming, cunning. Uh, your time as a bandit has granted you a sense for danger and made you skilled at sizing up opponents. You gain the following benefits. One damage resistance or immunity, one condition immunity. Um, yeah. These are really cool. Opportunistic thief. And the other thing is like, not a lot of these sound like ripoffs of other feats that I've read, right? They all seem kind of like, oh yeah. yeah. Uh, when a creature fails a melee attack against you in combat, you may make a dexterity slide a hand check against a DC equal to 10, plus the target's dexterity modifier. On success, you may steal any one item that is not being held or worn by the target. Mm-hmm. That's nice. You have learned the tricks of the trade of thievery. Perfect landing, speech of the ancient beasts, and woodwise. Y'all know I'm good at woodwise, right? Uh, I don't know what that means. You have lived your entire life in the gnarled wood, wooded areas of the world. You are adept at finding your way through even the most treacherous terrain. You gain the following benefits. Hmm. Um... And difficult terrain, stuff like that. So those are some of the feats. 
And again, uh, these are drag and drop as well. So if you're playing in the game, you have your um, character sheet up. You can just drop them in. Uh, unique items. Let's look at that. Look at that. Does that pull up here? Do I get a lot of stuff from the SRD? Let's see. Yeah, I get a lot of stuff from the SRD when I do that. Um, so instead, um, actually, they might be in here. Magic items right here. Look at that. I don't have to do anything. Yeah, just look up all these items. Uh, hello there. Uh, Blade of the Wood. What else? Uh, there's that brooch, cloak of strig, uh, feather token. What else you got here? What looks interesting? Uh, this Necronomicon looks pretty interesting. Uh, dark necromancy, uh, abyssal secrets, brass of shadows. Yeah, this comes later in the book. Wing crush shield. Yeah, lots of new items to play with. Uh, lots of stuff that you can give to your players. Uh, feathered helm. I don't remember this one. Uh, helm itself is simple. Leather, blah, blah. Bird folk races of uh, humble wood consider giving the feather to be one of the highest honors. The helm has three charges that while wearing it uh, activated its abilities. Uh, has different pro oh this is cool so the helm has different properties based on the race of the bird folk who is gifted the feather so if you're a corvin uh you can use a charge to cast the cast hideous laughter and two charges to cast uh detect thoughts uh gallius you can charge which makes sense right because corvins are super smart and um you know can like really read people uh for gallus you can charge to cast bless and two charges to cast aid which is great because they're like super happy communal type people that would make sense uh luma you can charge to cast a random first level spell it's source of page blah, blah. uh these are all awesome uh i do wish there was more like little humble folk um it relies pretty heavily on like bird folk and like that stuff like that i imagine there will be more uh this is a fairly popular um you know campaign setting so that would be cool uh creature stats uh player handouts let's look at some creature stats so <laughs> uh this ash snake might be one of the first big boys that your uh characters might get up to finding uh ash cover Ash Snake has advantage on dexterity stealth checks made when it's burrowing in ash, as well as a plus four bonus to its armor cast. Boom. Uh, eruption. So you basically have the snake burrowing and exiting and burrowing and exiting. So this is the first big baddie that you start, uh, that your level one, level two guys go. Um, and I think, you know, spoiler alert, uh, this is the big bad. Uh, called Aspect of Fire. Uh, I believe this is what is causing all the bad stuff to go down. And this is a big boy. This is big beefy. Uh, 174. It throws magma. Uh, stomps. Uh, has molten fists. Molten skin. Uh, nat it naturally gives off life. So he's not going to be able to like hide anywhere. Um, and fuel for the fire. This is a, this is a big guy. Uh, and I believe the last, you know, I'll just show you the final battle, which you can picture. Look at this big boy right here. You don't want to mess with him. But yeah, I'll deal with different types of slime. Oh, slime's so disgusting. Spoiler alert. Yeah, I've been saying it every 10 minutes here. Uh, yeah, Fire Spectre. Yeah, the artwork's great. The team at Roll20 did a great job with, even with these, like, token, look at these tokens, these little branches and stuff like that that goes around. Makes it really look good. Uh, these Ember Bats, great ooze. Yeah, I think, I think that's just about it. That just about wraps it all up. 
Um, we kind of looked at everything. I don't want to go too far in. Uh, a lot of times, you know, I, I want you guys to read this and know exactly. Uh, I like reading, going through the plot points for you and showing you a preview of that and then kind of like grazing over. Uh, oh, I know. Uh, I didn't talk about the religions, right? Oh, obviously. Got to talk about the religions. Let's do that. Um, do, 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 do. I get to it. Compendium. Humblewood. Here we go. Um, I haven't dug too far into the religions, right? Um, I love that they wrote so many of them. Uh, and they all have very specific meanings and uh, symbolism. And that was something I was very surprised at when I started reading this book. It was just like, you know, this person worships this and they like that done. This person worships this and they like that done. Um, but it reads like, you know, the f animal folklore is just really cool, I guess. Uh, and to think about animals who have their own animal folklore, uh, just tickles me a little bit. Uh, so we learn about like these, uh, you know, uh, powerful deities or gods, uh, that kind of, you know, some of them live in this like spiritual world. Some of them go to like this world of like this death world, but it's really not death. It's really not like hell or anything. It's like the darkness, um, you know, uh, but like how it applies to like your life and um, dogmatic like thoughts or, um, you know, laws that you might have. Um, and this, I feel like really helps. Um yeah, and it really looks good in text. It, this really helps with characters getting into the mindset of animals, right? Uh, you know, we talked and we looked at these animals and we were like, you know, I said funny things and, you know, uh, birds and hedgehogs and stuff like that. But I feel like this is an unsung part of the book. Uh, because this kind of puts it into perspective of what an animal, uh, might be thinking based on their like religion or, uh, you know, uh, some great possum or <laughs> like, look at that. Like, yeah, it's just like midsummer over here. Um, and it just makes it a little bit easier, right? It makes it a little bit easier to get into that mindset of, you know, this wind spirit or, um, um, this hunter. And yeah, I just, I don't know why I thought this was like the best section. It's really cool. I, I feel like it's a missing piece for this game that it was like very necessary to have here. Um, but yeah, guys, it's Humblewood. Uh, thank you for sticking around so long and learning it with me. I had so much fun. Uh, this game is really cool. Uh, it's such a great addition and I love that like people can play it and play it on roll 20. Uh, and again, super simple. I love that I was able to show you and walk you through this book the way I look at books on roll 20. Uh, I learn in real time, uh, and I could actually play in real time, which is so cool. I don't have to like stay up a couple days and kind of like read an entire book and like prepare and whatever. Uh, when you purchase campaign, when you purchase a campaign setting with like an actual module in there built into it, uh, it's great because it, you're off to the races and, you know, I'm a little bit spoiled where like, uh, I, I don't know if I can go back. Uh, <laughs> even if, even if I bought a physical book and was like prepared to play at a table, um, with people without digital help, I would still rather learn the adventure this way. This way for me is a million times easier. Uh, uh, before, if you would look at any of my books, they would be lined with little stickies everywhere. I don't know if anyone, I'm sure you guys do stickies. Uh, yeah, like everyone has to do stickies where they're just like constantly putting stickies everywhere on stuff uh, and just flipping through it and color coding it. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, no longer do that. All I do, uh, yeah, 
<laughs> like that's what we really need to talk about, right? We really need to talk about how the RPG, like someone who has stock in RPG uh, books has also has stock in like sticky companies. Uh, I, it's a conspiracy that I'm blowing up today. Uh, you can quote me online for that. Uh, you can find me on social media under Carlos Critz. Just tag me and let me know where the conspiracy is going. Uh, I'm sure Staples is behind all of this. Staples wants us to fail completely. Um, <laughs> but thanks for hanging out, guys. I really do appreciate it. Um, but if you know, uh, let me know in the comments if you're on, if you watch this on YouTube or if you watch it here, like hit me up online. Let me know if you liked it. Uh, I'm planning on doing more of these when, when books come out. Uh, they're just like a lot of fun and I get to, you know, really finish an entire book instead of, you know, finding this book and getting distracted and backing another book. So this was really cool. Thank you for hanging out guys. Uh, I'll see you next time. Bye.